really great to be here. Uh, I was sitting thinking as I was reading the reckoning. You, you all got the mic? I was, I was reading the reckoning word, and it, I, I remembered it's a, one of my favorite lines from a movie, if you all remember it, and it was from Tombstone. And it was Doc, Hall Doc Holliday said about Wyatt Earp, and he said, it's not revenge he is after, it's a reckoning. And I think that's really important to keep in mind as we expose ourselves to people of different viewpoints, Donald Trump, whatever those are, it's not revenge we're after. It's not revenge which any of us should be after. It's a reckoning of where we are. I am, um, I think we're in an incredibly disruptive moment. Uh, none of us have seen this in our lifetimes. Um, I actually think we have, as a country haven't seen this until 240 years ago as we approach our 250th anniversary of our Declaration of Independence that we have. It's disruptive in many ways. It's destructive. It's accelerated change. Um, we're going to have to face it. But I think it's an incredibly optimistic, hopeful, and exciting time. Because change doesn't happen when everybody's satisfied with the status quo. Change doesn't happen when everything's running and everybody's fine and everything that it, it, things are good as the way they are. Change happens in very disruptive moments that we have. So I'm hopeful, but I wasn't always hopeful. Uh, in my life. I used to keep, um, I'm a big, I'm Irish, big fan of Yeats, um, and I used to keep a quote of his. I'm one of 11 children, Irish, Catholic, Detroit, and if I told you my brothers and sisters names, you'd be like, yeah, yeah I know he's Irish, Catholic. They were Mary Denise, Matt, Pat, Pan, Dan, Paul, Katie, Kelly, Beth, John, Steve. <laughs> um, but the quote was, the Irish have an abiding sense of tragedy which sustains them through temporary periods of joy. And I kept that quote on every campaign I worked on, um, that I worked in. But I have become much more hopeful and optimistic, and it's something I want to touch on, actually through tragedy. And at the end, I want to talk about that for just one sec, about what those things that are important to us. In a matter of a few years, I jettisoned my political career. I broke with President Bush on the front page of the New York Times. I lost a sister to drug overdose. I lost a daughter. And my son was sent to Iraq for two tours of duty, all in a matter of a couple of years, all of that in a matter of a couple of years. And that, instead of making me bitter, actually grew my sense of optimism and hope and grows your sense. And all of us have to face that decision in our life as things happen to us. Does our heart grow or does it become smaller? Do we become warmer or do we become colder through all the wounds and hurts in our lives? I think we are going through economic, technological, cultural change. We're in the midst of the third industrial revolution that's changed dramatically from all the technology that's happened before. We've lost faith and trust in every single institution simultaneously. Every single institution we've lost faith and trust in. Our economic institutions, our media institutions, our political institutions, and our government, governmental institutions we've lost faith in. And as we look at that expanse, the election was dropped in the middle of that. And I think somebody earlier said, um, mentioned this, Donald Trump was not the cause of this. Donald Trump's emergence is a symptom of what's been going on for the last 25 or 30 years. He is not the cause. He is a symptom of this tremendous change that's happened. And what we have a tendency to do is we have a tendency to focus on the volcanoes and the earthquakes. So a volcano happens and we focus on it. It's like, oh my gosh, can you believe that happened? Or an earthquake happens. And what we really should be focusing is on the tectonic shifts that have been going on in our country for 25 or 30 years. The tectonic shifts of our economy, the tectonic shifts of our culture, the tectonic shifts of all the things that have changed that would have revealed what was going to emerge and what may emerge in the years ahead as we see this. The two political parties, to my view, are dinosaurs. And the meteor has already hit the planet. And the two dinosaurs are sitting there munching in a field, and the cloud's coming for them. And they think they're fine, and they think they're all fine, but they're not. And if you think about innovation in our society today, the last two areas that have not fundamentally been innovated are our politics and our government. Fundamentally not been innovated. Everything else has pretty much been innovated in, in, in what we have. If you walk down the grocery store, walk in the grocery store, and walk down the toothpaste aisle, you have 156 varieties of toothpaste to choose from. And then you turn the corner and go down the bread aisle. 
You have 228 varieties of bread to choose from. You walk in the voting booth and they say, pick. Pick between two, they say, people say. That's going to change and it's already moving and it's already changing as we face this. To me, what lessons do we need to learn? And it was talked about earlier, which I was fascinated by the conversation related to some of our founding fathers. We can learn from what of our founding fathers. The change that's going to be driven in our politics, in our culture, and in our governance is going to be driven by entrepreneurs and artists. Entrepreneurs and artists are going to drive the change. Fundamentally, they're going to drive the change. And if you think about our founding fathers, they were the ultimate entrepreneurs. What did they do? They had a startup. And the startup was a country. And they basically launched into this because they did not think the government was operating in the best interest of, let's say, most of the country. Um, because there was still much to be done over the course of the last 240 years in this. But that's our lessons. We have to figure out innovation, imagination, integrity, independence. How do we do that in this culture and how do we revise that to that? To me, there are some fundamental lessons we have to keep in mind. We're in a time of alternative facts and fake news. And where the discovery of the truth is incredibly, incredibly hard, but our democracy depends on it. Because any democracy, in any democracy, you have to have the ability to come together for the common good. If you don't have the ability to come together for the common good and you stay in your tribe, you stay fat and happy in your tribe and everybody thinks alike, then if you do that, then you can't have a democracy. And the thing the common good is contingent on is a common set of facts. And we don't have a common set of facts in our country today. We have people with all sorts of different facts. And if you have a different set of facts, if you and I have a different opinion, we can come together and have a conversation. But if you have a set of facts and I have a set of facts, we can never reach consensus. And I think it's important for us to understand truth. And it's a great thing about the false choices that we're facing in our life. And a book, the book that I just have now out, it's basically called A New Way, Embracing the Paradox as we lead and serve. And it's the, the whole idea of it is everything that we ought to be at is not picking between a binary choice. It's figuring out where the paradox is that. And truth is like that. Because we have to both understand uncertainty in our lives, but search for the truth. And the truth isn't always a rational connection. This is what I think many people have tried to confront Trump supporters or Trump fans with a rational argument. Much of the truth is exposed to us in an emotional way. And if you have an emotional connection, that emotional connection will not be broken by a rational argument. The only way to break an emotional connection is with another emotional connection. And once you have an emotional connection, you can have an, a rational argue, argument with another human being or a rational conversation with another human being. Second, the rise of independence in our country. People want choice. People want a choice in the taxi cab industry and the Uber started. People want choice in how they bought Amazon started. People want choice in how they booked hotels, Airbnb started. And so the solution to this isn't repainting the Democratic yellow cab or the Republican yellow cab. It's figuring out where there's something new to emerge in this time. There's no reason why it can't. There is not a single word in the Declaration of Independence or in the Constitution of the United States that says political party, that says Democrat or says Republican in either of those documents. And so part of this is we have to under, we, we can resolve and we can figure out how we deal with the two legacy parties that exist today in politics. But a big part of this is what new things can we create? The third thing is social entrepreneurs are going to drive the change. Everybody in this room and all the things that you're involved in will fundamentally drive the change that needs to occur in this country in the aftermath of what we've seen exposed in the election from last year. I have a funny story. Uh, David Axelrod, who was Barack Obama's chief strategist, I was George Bush's chief strategist, we did a uh, a seminar at the University of Chicago together last year about the race. And we agreed to do it. We're going to do this up at the University of Chicago where David teaches, <clears throat> where he has an institute. And we kept batting back and forth, back and forth. What should we call this seminar about the campaign? And I finally called him. I said, let's just call it what it is, Campaign 2016 WTF. <laughs> we almost can say that about White House WTF today. 
So I think social entrepreneurs are going to have to do it. And as Eric said, I'm a big believer in country over party. I'm trying to push a whole movement related to that about people saying, yes, you can be a Democrat, or yes, you can be a Republican, or yes, you can be an independent, or yes, you can be somebody that's green. But let's now put the country ahead of our partisan interests. Let's figure out how to do it, put our con country ahead of that. <clears throat> But we also need to do that as social entrepreneurs. We also need to put community ahead of profit. We need to put the Constitution ahead of personal power. All of those ways are our way to resolve this, I think, in an innovative way. Some practical lessons that I think are, are to take away from this. First, we have to end the ends justify the means politics. That we have a politics today that says, if you have a good end or you believe in your ends, you can do whatever means is necessary. The problem today in America is that the means of politics are broken. The means are broken. We have an inability to come together. We have an inability to have a conversation. We have an inability to relate to each other on where they stand. And until we fix the means, we're not going to get the ends we want. So we have to fix the means of governance and a means of politics. The second is the change is going to be driven locally. It's not a top-down change. It's not like, let's go find us another presidential candidate, and that's going to fix the problem. The change is going to be driven by people in Seattle, people in Tacoma, people in Austin, Texas, people in Detroit, people in Kalamazoo. People all over the country are going to drive the change locally first. It's not going to be driven by finding us the next presidential candidate. Third, the pendulum has swung so far to a level of narcissism that I was unaware of existed uh, that it's going to naturally, with a little push from all of us, to go back to an idea of humble servant leaders. Humble servant leaders <clears throat> who go back and do this. Now, humility, this is not like, oh, I'm humble. Like, don't, don't, I'm the best at being humble. Don't worry about it. Um, I like to paraphrase Margaret Thatcher. Humility and humbleness, I'm going to paraphrase her. She's, is, humility is a lot like being a lady. If you have to tell people you are, you're probably not. So it's got to be authentic to the person in this. And I think in humble servant leaders, and this is where I wanted to go back to what I said at the beginning of the tragedy that led me to more hope and optimism, is our first order of business is not to try to meet somebody in their politics. The way to have a relationship with somebody and then get them in a conversation of the politics is to either meet them in their wounds and their pains or in their joys. Because everybody shares the same joys Everybody shares the same ability when they're in a relationship and the happiness that surrounds those relationships or a birth or with that. And everybody shares the same pain, having a disabled child, having lost a loved one, having gone through addiction with somebody in your family. Every single person, whether it's Democrat, Republican, Trump supporter, Trump hater, whatever they happen to be. So to me, part of being a humble servant leader is to putting the politics secondarily until you build a relationship based on either somebody's joys or based on somebody's wounds or pains in the course of that. And the final thing I want to say is we have to take back the meaning of faith and patriotism. Faith and patriotism has been captured by a very small group of people that define it in a certain way. And one thing I've told somebody one time I was, if someone tells you that in order to love your God or your country, you have to hate somebody, they're not a person of faith and they're not a patriot. If, <clears throat> and so we, we, re, we, resolve, we resolve where we are today. To me, we are at an unbelievable moment that I'm incredibly excited about. I think what, you doing, what you're doing here, why you're here for these, this day and a half that you're here. We have an opportunity to be the 21st century founding mothers, fathers, daughters, and sons. The founding mothers, fathers, and daughters, and sons of an entirely new type of country that we haven't seen before. We have that opportunity. And the last 14 words, I'll end with the last 14 words of the Declaration of Independence that I think all of us, the last 14 words of the Declaration of Independence are, we mutually pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And if we can figure out how to get people to buy into that new Declaration of Independence, then I think we have an opportunity to reshape the country in the manner and the way it actually looks 
today, not the way somebody is telling us the country ought to be. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate being here.